Like I said, we're going to be in John 3.16 today. So if you have a Bible, please turn there. If you don't, there should be a Bible around the seat there. Uh, the black Bible will be on page 888. And as always, will you guys please stand as we read God's Word together. John 3.16, a passage that we are all familiar with. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. I'm going to read one more passage. Please just listen to me. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Let's pray. Father, thank You for these two verses. These two verses declare Your love for us. For every individual in this room, Lord, You love us. And You want us to know how great a love it is. It's an amazing love as we will see. This this verse might be familiar to us, but let us, again, let us fall in love with this passage of how You love us. And for some, it might be the first time they've ever heard this passage read. And I pray that it would impact their hearts to the point where they would bow their knee to you to see you as their good father, as their king, as their savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Guys, go ahead and have a seat. Again, Merry Christmas. Oh, someone fixed the lights on the tree. That things were black. And I was like, I might have a seizure up here if I look there. That thing's lights keep on blacking. But, but today we're looking at, again, John 3.16. And John 3.16 is probably the most famous verse in all the Bible. And infinitely so, we're going over it today because we're in the fourth day, uh, week of Advent, which the topic is love. And I can't think of a better verse to go over than John 3.16 when talking about God's love. And, we, and we're gathering today and focusing on Christmas, probably the greatest day in the history of mankind is when Jesus was born and given to us out of God's love 2,000 years ago. Is Easter important? Absolutely. It's like 1A and 1B with Christmas and Easter. But remember, Easter doesn't happen unless Christmas happens, right? Unless God sends His Son. Martin Luther called John 3.16 the Bible in miniature. Most missionaries, when they go over to cross uh, cultural missions and they don't have an English translation or a translation of the Bible in their native tongue, what they do is they, they translate usually John 3.16 first out of any other verse in the Bible. Because again, it declares God's love and redemption um, goal in the world. These 24 words give us probably one, if not the greatest sentence in all the Bible. And not only all the Bible, all the world. Out of every sentence ever penned, what we just read is the greatest sentence ever penned. John 3.16. I was invited to go see, uh, me and my family were invited to go see Tim Tim, Tim Tebow uh, a couple, about a month ago, to, to speak, right? People say, hey, you're an athlete you're an, or an ex-athlete. You know, the, better, the older I get, the better I was, right? You're an ex-athlete and you're a Christian, so you should come see Tim Tebow. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, let me come see him uh, and listen to Tim, Te- Tim Tebow speak. He was a great speaker. He loves Jesus. And he told us a story about when he was getting ready for the play in the national championship game in 2008. For the whole season, he'd wear in his eye black, you know, the black things under his eyes, uh, and he wrote a verse in there, Philippians 4.13. But for the national championship game, he felt the Lord saying, I got, I got to change this up. So he changed the scripture on his eye black to John 3.16. And you know what happened that night? As he was playing, as the game was going on, 94 million people Googled what is John 3.16. Isn't that crazy? Just because a college athlete throwing around a pigskin had John 3.16 written under in his eye black, 94 million people Googled, what is John 3.16? Tim Tebow's first thought, he said, was this. How do 94 million people not know John 3.16, right? I mean, you're probably thinking the same thing. We think that everyone should know John 3.16, but the reality is, in the culture we live in, in the world we live in, not everyone does. So all the more for us to talk about John 3.16 and His great love for us this morning. Now, most of us in here know John 3.16, but there might be some in here that for the first time just heard John 3.16. And we're glad you're here. That's awesome. Why? Because again, as we celebrate 
Christmas, Advent, I can think of no better verse than John 3.16. We've gone over hope, we've gone over peace, we've gone over joy, and today we're going to focus on love. God's love for us. It is the supreme virtue in the Christian faith. The supreme virtue. So let's dive right in. First we see the amazing love of God. John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Stop right there. When you, when you think of God, think of the Christian faith, what are the characteristics that come to your mind? What pops into your mind when I say God the Father? Do you think of the gospel? Do you think of grace? Do you think of forgiveness? Do you think of the cross? Do you think of he's, he's sovereign? He's holy? Well, here, John tells Nick, or otherwise known as Nicodemus, that you should think of love. You should think of God the Father as a lover. Love in the Bible is, is usually understood like this, not solely sentimental, based on feelings and emotions. That's how the world looks at love. The world, when we define love, they say it's, it's primarily a feeling. It's probably something you feel. It's an emotion. And, and the Bible says it's that, but it's so much more. It's not only sentimental, but it's sacrificial. Here's a great definition of love. You should write this down. Love is this. It is a commitment and a costly affection proved through action. Love is a committed and costly affection proved through action. Who was living, who was around living in 1992? Go ahead and raise your hand. Hand for you. I half was, half wasn't. If you guys remember the group DC Talk, right? That great theological, yeah, DC Talk, right? Well, they got it right in their song, Love. Love is a what? It's a verb. It's an action applied with motion, emotion. This is what biblical love is. And Jesus here is teaching that God's motivation to save the world is love. Look at that phrase again. God so loved the world. Circle that little word so in your Bibles. That's an important word. God so loved the world. He could have just said God loves the world. God is a lover of the world. But he adds this little word so. And this little word intensifies the meaning of God's love. It, 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 it heightens it. It's mean. It's uh, outcome. It's kind of like when you add jalapenos to nachos, right? It just kind of ups it, the intensity of the, I don't know where that came from. It just popped in my mind, all right? So go with me, all right? But the point is God has an intense, sacrificial affection for the world. Who is the world there? It's not the animal kingdom. It's not the planet. God loves those things. He created them. It's you. It's me. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, it's the the world of men and women. That's where God loves. That's his intensity. That's his focus is on us. Now, our natural tendency when we hear ver- words like love, again, we, we assume um, how God loves us by the way we experience and know love. And that's, that's right. That's natural. And, and sometimes it, it, it works for the Scripture when we interpret it, but sometimes it comes up a little short. Uh, like in this case, when we say that God so loved the world, again, we assume that his love for the world is like our love for others because of what we naturally know, like I just said. So I love my wife. I don't just love my wife. I so love my wife, right? And, and that's how God loves the world. Uh, and, and, and God has given us that ability to, to love. And so we get that. We, we, uh, we love our spouse. We love our family. We, uh, I love eggnog, right? I love Christmas songs. Anyone with me, right? We, we love these things. But... Our motivations, when we begin, are a little bit different than God's motivation and love and what he's talking about here. And here's where we see the depth of God's love for us. And this is crucial for us as Christians to understand this passage to its fullness. This is crucial to understanding God's amazing love for you and me. You see, I love my wife because she is lovely. Yes. I love my wife because she's beautiful. She's passionate. She's an, she has an incredible heart. She's a great mom. She's a great spouse. She's kind. She works hard. And I can go on and on and on. And that's how you love too. The people that you give your love to, you see them as worthy. Right? You see them as valuable. That's how we do in love. We set our love on those things that are lovable and worth loving. And this is where God's love is in a different ballpark than ours. You see, because God's motivation isn't based on the object's worthiness. God loves because, as 1 John 4 says, He is love. It's who He is. He doesn't look on the object and say, is it lovely or not lovely? If it is lovely, then I'll love it. No, He doesn't do that. He automatically loves the world. 
you and me and everyone in it because he is love. And this is where we got to kind of take off our kind of our self-love, our self-worth glasses and, and to feel the weight of God's love for you and me to see how amazing it really is. Because in reality, you and I, apart from Christ, outside of Christ, are not lovely. We're not lovely. Look a little bit down in verse 19. It says, and this is the judgment, the light, Jesus has come into the world. And people, you and me, apart from Christ, loved, we make sacrifices for the darkness rather than the light. That's what we do apart from Christ. I've done it, you've done it. Apart from Christ, we're haters of God. We're haters of the things of His kingdom. We don't want to follow Him. We want to follow our own agenda. And we see that this love, we make sacrifices. We put our family on the altar. We put our friends, our reputation, to seek those things that are ungodly. Light has come into the world, and we, the people, love the darkness. We're not lovely to the Lord. This one illustration just really solidified this in my mind. Adolf Eichmann was one of the masterminds in the concentration camps in World War II where they killed millions of Jews. He was arrested in South Africa and put on trial in 1961. They, they gathered the, the, the Jews that survived the concentration uh, camp to testify against him as he was on, on trial. One of those witnesses was this man named Yehiel Durner who spent two years in Auschwitz, the original concentration camp. And when he walked into the courtroom and saw Eichmann face to face for the first time in years, he fell to the ground and he began to weep and to wail. Mike Wallace, who was doing the interview, asked him this. He said, when you first saw Eichmann, were you overcome by hatred? Were you overcome by fear? Did, did all the horrific you know, uh, things that happened to you flood your memory? What was it that brought you to the ground weeping? And this is what you hear said. He said, no, it was none of these. Rather, at once he realized Eichmann was not a godlike army officer who had sent so many to their deaths. This Eichmann was an ordinary man just like him. And he said this, I was afraid about myself. He said, I saw that I am capable to do this. I am exactly like him. This is what we're talking about. You and I, are, apart from Christ, are not lovely. This is what we've been talking about in Genesis, right? Uh, we see that Genesis, by the time we get to Genesis 6, three chapters earlier, Adam and Eve fall in Genesis 3. By the time we get to 6, it says that the Lord is grieved because he sees the wickedness of man and woman on the earth. And he's grieved that he created them. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever done something in your life or thought about something in your life so wicked that you're just like, whoa, where, where did that come from? I know how I have. Anyone else here with me want to raise their hand? A couple of you, good. Yeah, we all have, right? This, one of the best ways I heard a pastor describe this about 20, 25 years ago, it stuck with me. He was preaching, talking about the total depravity of man and how we love this. And he said, he stood up and he said, if you knew what I thought, some of my thoughts in my mind over the last week, you, you wouldn't come to hear me preach because you'd be like, man, you're, you're, you're a pretty unloving person. And then he said, but if I knew what your thoughts were this week, he said, I'd keep those doors locked and wouldn't let you in, right? Because we're all on the same. Apart from Christ, we have our own agenda. But John is saying to the world, to you and me, that this is who God sets his love on. Not because we are worthy, but because he is love. This is the amazing thing about God's love. He loves us in this state. It's an amazing love. So God loves us because He is love. And by His grace, He has set it on you and me this morning. That's an amazing truth. That leads us to the second thing. The amazing gift of God's love is Jesus. Look at 3.16 again. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. That's what we're celebrating this uh, tomorrow or Tuesday. We're celebrating of God's love by the giving of His only Son, Jesus. How does God show His love? I said He shows it by giving us the delight of His heart, His own Son. 
This is God's love. It compels him to be a generous giver. 1 John chapter 4 says this, This is love. This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loves us and he sent his son to be the propitiation or sacrifice for our sins. We see that God loves his world. This love is the motivation. It's the thing that, that uh, initiates his giving of Jesus to the world, this Savior. I love how one says it. He says it this way. He says, God the Father has given us a, a gorgeous creation to live in, right? He's, he's given us this, our bodies, and they have this uh, uh, self-healing powers in, in and of itself. Uh, we have a mind that can figure things out. We have a relationship that, that makes life rich, and it, we can go on and on and on. But these are just earthly gifts of God. They come and go. But if we base our confidence on God's love for us, on our health or our safety or any other, God, uh, any other good gift, in the moment, we'll never be sure about God. Right? You get that? He said, so God revealed His love with this. Such finality that we can know for keeps. We can know for sure that God so loved the world. Why? Because He gave us His only Son. You see, here it is. God did not loan us His Son. He gave Him up to the cross for you and for me. Jesus was born to die. This is the love of the Father for you and for me. God gave us Jesus to be our substitute on the cross. He's the one that was lifted up so that we may be saved. This is how much God loves you. That He sent His only Son. I love how Augustine puts it. Augustine puts it that the cross is the pulpit that God preached the love of God to the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I, this is tough for me to fathom to imagine to do those of us who are parents understand this those of us that you will be parents you'll understand this as well god gave up his son so that others may live he crucified him he died could you do that could you give up your son could you give up your daughter so others may live i don't know that i could there's a great little uh short story short movie uh this, this is kind of a parable of this uh this truth, it's called most. Anyone ever here seen that word, most? I, I've, I've given you, the, type in the word most, M-O-S-T, and then put train bridge, and you'll get this video. It's short, it's only about 10 minutes, but it is powerful. It will help you visualize and see what the Lord is talking about here, about giving up His Son. In short, it's about um, this father who who this train comes over this, uh, this river, and his, his job is to put the you know, bridge down so the train can cross. Well, in the midst of that, his son was out fishing, but he runs up and somehow gets tangled up into the bridge, and the father sees his son, sees the train of hundreds of people coming, and he has a dilemma. Does he drop the bridge so the train doesn't crash into the, you know, the frozen lake or river, or does he keep it up to spare his son's life? I'll let you guys look at it. It's, it's a powerful clip about this truth that God so loved the world that He gives us our Son or His Son. We just finished up 2018, 2019. And, 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 and in this, if you've experienced the gift of Jesus to you, it should, it should do something to you. It should, it should cause you to now be the giver of good gifts. If the whole, um, we see that we now have an opportunity to give sacrificially like our Heavenly Father. Now, obviously, no one in here has to give up their son or daughter. That has already been done for us. But that should be a characteristic of, of everyone in here who has repented and trusted in Christ, is that we should be givers just like our Heavenly Father is a give givers. At Rocky Mountain High School, our, our kids, uh, Stephen and Maddie, and, and, and those of you also that attend maybe high schools, maybe in one of your classes, they... They want to uh, rally around some families that have need around this time. And so they, they send out a sign-up sheet with all these different kinds of items that these kids, these families need, everything from like toiletries to clothes to, to jackets, right? And there's like 50 items or something like that on there. And so it's, it's, it gets passed around the classroom, and it comes to, to Madison, and, and she sees that there's barely, barely anyone signing up to bring anything to bless these families, to, to give to these families. So, so, so what does Madison do? She signs up for everything, okay? And rightly so, right? And rightly so. Why? Because she knows the gift of Jesus. She understands that a good father has given her salvation. 
And so when the, the, the world is selfish and doesn't want to give, the Christian stands up and says, I'll do it. I'll give. And they give sacrificially. Now, Rhea and I are still going to you know, try and figure out how we're going to pay for all this stuff, right? But the point is, she's a giver. Why? Because she is, she's experienced the gift. And you have too. Now, we, we talk about here throughout the crossing the, to give through our time, our, our talents, and our treasures, right? And those are three areas in which kind of encompass our life. And, and we might excel in one or maybe two of those things, right? Some of us in here excel in giving our time and, 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 and talents like serving one another. Uh, but maybe not so much in, in, in giving. Some of us do a great job in giving and maybe not so much in time or are sharing our gifts that God has given us. So let's make 2019, let us all look to be more well-rounded as Christians. Let us all look to, to imitate our Father in heaven who is the giver of good gifts. And let's look to excel in giving of our time our talents, and our treasures to first and foremost each other, those who are in the household of faith, but then also those who are outside the household of faith. Let us bring them the good news of this amazing gift that we have experienced, the gift of Jesus this morning. Takes us to our third point. So we've seen the amazing love of God. We've seen the gift, the amazing gift of God. And here, thirdly, we see the amazing purposes of God's love. Again, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. So that, purpose clause, or for this reason, for this purpose, whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. So what is the purpose of this love? The purpose of this love is that you and I would have eternal life. That we would receive and get salvation. This is the theme of this kind of paragraph of thought from, from Jesus explaining this to Nicodemus. Look at verse 15. So that may have eternal life. Look at verse 16. That they would not perish but have eternal life. Look at verse 17. Not to condemn the world but to save the world through Him. This is the purpose of God's love. To save you and me. This was the mission of His first advent. The mission of Christmas. What we're celebrating on Tuesday. The birth of Jesus in the manger. This is why he came, as Luke says, to come and seek and save the lost. Now, most of us in here on, on Tuesday morning, that's when you open up your Christmas gifts, not, Tuesday, not Monday night, Christmas morning, all right? We're going to get a lot of good gifts, but there's no greater gift that we have been given than that of eternal life. Now, how is eternal life obtained? It's obtained by the love of God. God is the one that has obtained eternal life for you and for me by sending His Son to live the perfect life in our place, to die on the cross, to make payment for our sin. That's how uh, eternal life is obtained, purchased. But how do we obtain it? We obtain it by repenting of our sins and believing in the gift that the God the Father has given us, and that is Jesus. We obtain it by repenting of our sins and trusting in Him. Again, Jesus was born to die so that you and I may live. That's what John is saying here. This is what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. You see, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is sufficient to save everyone who ever lived, who ever walked on the face of the earth. But it's only efficient. It's only applied to those who repent and believe in Jesus. So you must believe this morning. Do you believe? Do you believe in the gift that God has given us some 2,000 years ago? And the man, Christ Jesus. Quickly, let me give you three aspects of saving faith. Of believing that saves you and me. First, you have to understand and know the gospel. It's intellectual. It's mine. You have to understand as we explain that, 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 that we're rebels to God. And that He had to send Jesus to, to live and to die and to be resurrected. We have to understand that, that the only way to heaven is through Christ and His sacrificial atonement. So we have to understand and know the gospel and that those that get it re repent and believe in that. But then it has to go to the heart, right? You have to believe it's true. So you have to know it, you have to understand it, but then you have to believe it in your heart. You have to, you have to grasp it by faith and know it's true. And then this believing, this knowing leads to something. It leads to action. It leads to repentance. It leads to you and I saying like, yes, I see my need for the Savior. I see that I fall short of the glory of God. I see that I'm rebelling against the King. So I bow my, now, my, my knee. 
I repent of my sins and I trust in what Christ has done. This is saving faith. Have you believed in the good gift that God has given us? Again, some of you in here need to receive the gift of of Christmas. This morning, today, today is a day of salvation for you. You need to receive this gift. Jesus, you need to hear the same message and respond like the shepherds did to the angels in Luke chapter 2. That glorious account where it says the angels say to the shepherd, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is Christ the Lord. As to some of you in here today, that, that to, to respond to the beautiful, the amazing gift of Jesus so that you may live, have eternal life. That many of us in here have to re- be reminded of this great gift. And this is a wonderful thing about Christmas and Advent. That it, we, we take a pause and we look and we meditate on the baby in the manger and what that good gift symbolizes and means and what He has done for us. And we have to understand that it's God's love, not because we are lovely. Some of us in here have the tendency to get back on the treadmill of performance, right? That we got to show God that it's, it's a good thing that he, that he picked me, that I'm worthy, and we, gotta, we, we work for God. Look how much I love you, God. I'm, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you. And you per, put your worth into what you're doing for Him. And maybe because you had parents or friends that that their love was conditional on how you worked or obeyed for them. In other words, is that if you didn't follow their rules or regulations, they didn't give you love. Many of us have grown up in homes like that or have been taught that that's what love is, that love is conditional. But here what we're saying is love is not conditional. Love is based on who God is. And this morning we're reminded that God's love is by looking to the gift of Jesus in the manger. It's looking to his life and his death that led him to the cross. It's looking to his resurrection and realize that God loves you not for what you do for him, but who he is. He loves you. Here's the foundation of the Christian faith. It's this. It's not that we live for God and then he loves you. Right? You get that? It's not that you do all these things for God and then he says, oh, I see Aaron doing all these things, going to church, you're reading your Bible, you're doing life group. Oh, therefore, I'm going to set my love on you. That's not the Christian faith. That's every other religion in the world. It says you must first do something before you're approved. The Christian faith says this. God loves you, therefore you live for him. You see, duty is not the motivation for life and obedience. Love is. And it's God's love for you. And some of you got to hear that this morning. You have to get off the treadmill of performance and realize that's not what you do for God. God loves you just the way you are. You see, we're not following and obeying and living for Jesus for love. We follow, obey, and live for Jesus from love. This is just one of the great purposes of God's love. It's salvation. It's eternal life. Let me go to 1 John and give you a one more or a couple other purposes. And this is where we read for 1 John 3, 1 through 3. Just listen, I'll read it. But it says this again, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. This is the, probably my second favorite verse on love after all the Scriptures, obviously after John three sixteen. It's one of those verses that can never be exhausted. It's one of those verses that the truth and the depth of this truth is just, it's just endless. It's amazing to think about. John says, and he commands us to see, to look at what? The love of the Father has given to you and me. So again, let's continue to dive a little bit deeper and take even a better little, a quicker look at this love. The, the key of this phrase is, is in the phrase, what kind of love? See what kind of love. You have the NIV translation, it says, see how great a love. The, this, this little phrase in the original language means this, well, from what country or, or what nation or what tribe um, are you from? And it's used six times in the New Testament. It always implies astonishment or admiration. Astonishment or admiration. You guys remember in, in Matthew 6 or Matthew 4 where Jesus is on the boat there's a massive store in the Sea of Galilee. He's sleeping in the back of the boat, right? And the disciples are freaking out because they think the storm is just going to overtake them and they're going to die. You guys remember that story? And Jesus sleeping like a baby in the back of the boat. And then Jesus wakes up 
And he sees the apostles freaking out. And they're like, we're going to die, Jesus. Don't you care about us? We're going to die. And what does he do? He just stands up, looks at the creation, and he says, peace be still. And what happens? Total calm, right? Total calm. And what do the disciples say? They say this, what sort of man or what kind of man or how great a man that even the winds and the seas obey him? What they're saying is like, where is this guy from? We would say, what, what planet is this guy from? Where do you come from? Because you're not from around here. I tried this once. Um, I did. I did. We, you know, I, I was when I was a chaplain with the UNC football team. It was just pouring and raining, and I'm walking to uh, the training table breakfast before the game, and it's just, it's just, it's just raining. And I'm like, man, I don't want to be out here for four hours standing in this rain and getting soaked. I said, this is gonna suck. I don't want to do this, right? That was my heart attitude. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna try, do what try what Jesus did. And so in my best Harry Potter voice, I said, be still, raise my hand. And you know what happened? It rained harder. <laughs> I think it was the worst <laughs> rainstorm I've ever been in any game. It was crazy. But this is, this is the power and the love of Jesus. John Stott says this, the Father's love is so unearthly, so foreign to this world that John wonders what country it comes from. Here, the, the, apostle, the apostle John, at this point, when he writes 1 John, this point of the letter, he's in prison, as we know. He's probably about 60 years in the Christian faith and walking with the Lord. And the apostle John is still amazed by God's love. How much more should we be amazed by God's love? Again, some, some of you in here, you might walk through these doors and you, and you might not feel love today. You might not felt love uh, this whole week. Maybe it's been the whole year. And I'm here to tell you, if, you, if you're in Christ, if you repent and trusted in Him, even though you don't feel it, you need to hear me this morning on the authority of the Word of God that, this, that you need to know that you are loved beyond this world. That the one who created and shaped and molded this world, the one who created and shaped and, and knows every hair on your head, He loves you. And in fact, the, the love of God the Father, this is even better, that's been given or lavished out on us, is in the perfect tense here, the perfect verb tense, which means, which means this. It, it has permanent results and can be never taken away from you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never withdraw His love from you to hear that this morning. So do you get that? This is the good gift of God's Father, love for you, that He will never withdraw from you. Because again, it doesn't depend on you. It depends on who He is. And He is love. So therefore, we can be assured of that. See what kind of love the Father has given to you. It goes on, so that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Beloved, we are God's children now. And notice the, the exclamation points in there. John is, is fired up about this truth. He is excited about this truth. The God, the God the Father bestows His love on us through Jesus to adopt us as His sons and daughters. This is amazing. The reason why this is so amazing is because God the Father didn't need to to give us the privileges of adoption, to give us the privileges of becoming a son and daughter of the king. He could have just forgiven us. We still could have got heaven without adoption. There's, there's a number of characteristics in salvation. We, let me point out three. Regeneration, justification, and adoption. You see, we would be saved, we would gain heaven if, if God first regenerates our hearts. This is the spiritual reality that happens in our hearts. Our hearts are, are spiritually dead. They're hard, right? They're dark. And then God comes in and breathes life into our hearts, gives, takes out the heart of stone, gives us the heart of flesh. That's called regeneration. That's a spiritual uh, aspect of the gospel, the spiritual relationship that God gives us. And, and then it leads us to repent. And then God sees us repent and believe in Him. And then we are, are justified through us trusting in Christ. Um, God the Father, the judge, stands down and says, Aaron Santini, you're not guilty. And, and, and that's our, our, our legal standing before God the Father. 
And if it was just regeneration, our spiritual, we've been changed from the inside out. Our hearts have been created new. We're a new creation in Christ. We've been declared righteous. That's, that would be good enough. We would get heaven. But God loves us even that much more than that. He takes it to the next where he adopts us as sons and daughters. And this is our personal relationship with God. This is where our personal relationship comes to God. That he adopts us. And it's not our king. It's not our, it's not our judge. But it's our father. He's your father. He's my father. We get to walk and relate to him as a good and loving father. As a child relates to his father. We've been going through again Genesis and we've seen God as creator. We've seen him as Lord. We see him as provider and protector. But the role that is most intimate, the role that is most intimate is more relational, that has the highest privilege of fellowship with God for eternity is his role as a heavenly father. It's his role adopting you and me as his son and daughter. This is one of the purposes of God's love. So that you and I could be called children of the King. And that would be our identity. And so we are. I love this. I think of my children, you know, as their father. You know, outside of my wife, they, they're, they're second in line for my total attention. Right? They're second in line. If, 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 there's, if there's a need between my children and somebody else, and I have to pick one, guess who I'm picking every time? I'm picking my kids. Because that's what a good father does. He takes care of his children because of the relationship there. And this is what you need to know. That's what your loving Father in heaven does for you. He picks you every single time. And it's from birth to glory. He he causes us to be born again as we've seen in John 3.16. When we stumble, when we fall, when we feel unlovable, we do things that are unlovable to the Father, He has compassion and He understands and He still extends His mercy and grace to you and me. He extends His love to you and me. He takes care of our needs. I mean, I'm 47 years old, now three years from a 50 burger, okay? And so as I look back on my life, He takes care of all my needs. I've never had a lack He's always provided. He gives us many good gifts that we're going to sit around the table and celebrate You know, this Christmas. The gifts of family, the gifts of friends, the, the gifts of food, the gifts, of, the gifts that we get to enjoy, our, our hobbies, our passions. And ultimately, He gives us an inheritance in heaven that He's protecting for you and me. That's the love of a good father. That's what a good father does. He provides and protects and he cares and he cherishes and he nourishes and he gives good gifts to his children. I love what Wayne Grudem says. He says this. He says, when we begin to realize the excellence of these blessings and when we appreciate that God has no obligation to give us any of them, then we will be able to explain, uh, ex- exclaim with the Apostle John, see what kind of love The Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. So that's a question to you. Are you a child of the Father this morning? This is the love of God. This is the love that we get to experience and delight in this morning. This is the love of God that we celebrate during Christmas. But not only Christmas. Let it be every day we celebrate God's love for us. His amazing gift the way He loves us. I want to leave you with this charge this morning. Be a people of love as you have first been loved. Let love live in your heart and share the love of Christ with all you meet. Share love by loving those you see regularly, i.e. first your family, second your, your community, and third strangers. Share love by Loving those who you do not know. Share love by praying for our world. In this Advent season, we need to see, feel, and experience love. So as you go out into the wonder of God's creation, share love, share the joy, the peace, and the hope with all those you meet. Amen? Let's pray.